not only is it a great performer, but it's just beautiful. Hi, I'm Tom Gresham. Welcome to Wings to Adventure. You know, some pilots want to set world records, while others just want to fly a cub on a beautiful afternoon. Still others want to live in a beautiful grass strip with their airplanes around them. Today, we're going to meet a pilot who does all of that. It's going to be a great trip, so buckle up. Hey guys. Hello, Tom. Welcome to Flying Tiger Thank Airport. You. How you doing? Good to see you. That's one of the best grass trips I've ever landed on. Thank you. I really hate hearing that. But <laughs> it's my pride and joy. <laughs> Though no one in his family was involved in aviation, Bruce Bohannon said that on the day he was born, he hit the ground wanting to fly. <laughs> Bohannon's been a crop duster, a corporate pilot an aerobatic competitor, and an air racer. When he began to set absolute world records in his race plane, his aviation focus changed. The transition from air racing to, to world record setting was, was born of necessity also. Uh, we, we learned that, that our sponsors wanted coverage and racing really didn't generate much coverage. The Reno air races happened once a year and we would fly a smattering of little races here and there, but. Uh, the aviation press just didn't didn't follow air racing that close, but uh, when we set a world record, we got published everywhere, uh, and that's what led us to, to say, you know, what, instead of setting world records with a race plane, why don't we build an airplane specifically for world record setting? The end result was this, the Flying Tiger, the airplane that would go on to establish, at last count, 30 world records for Bruce and his team including all but one absolute time records for piston engine aircraft. Ah, this is it, the famous Flying Tiger. Pride of the fleet. Uh, Man, I my, guess. My son's got his Cub, my wife's got the RV4, but this is my office right here. I tell you, world record holder many times over. 30 times so far, we've got plenty left to come. Uh, right now, Tom, this is the fastest climbing piston airplane in, in history by all but one measure. Uh, we hold the time to climb to 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, and 40,000 feet in the unlimited class. So when people think about P-51s and all of that, this, we'll, this beats them. We'll take them on. <laughs> so uh, what have you got for the engine? The engine is a very special, uh, started out as a Lycoming IO 540. Mm -hmm. It's now a 555 due to Mattituck's magic again. Right. And uh, it makes 380 horsepower, uh, which is 30 more horsepower than the biggest engine Lycoming builds right now. What's it, what's it weigh? The airplane weighs about 1,200 pounds empty. Man, that is a serious uh, weight to, to energy, to horsepower ratio. Power to weight ratio is spectacular. The, the takeoff roll is four seconds from brake release to best rate of climb. <laughs> well, this is a gorgeous plane, so what do you do next with it? Well, we're still trying to set the U.S. altitude record. We've taken several runs at that. That record, ironically, is still held by the U.S. government. The Air right. Force set the record to 47,910 feet in 1946 and we came within 380 feet of that on our last attempt. To, to be able to take a little airplane like this and go break records that were once held by fighter planes is a big deal to me. But truly, the, the, the only zen thing out of this that I've been able to achieve is the first record I wanted to see my name in a book that I could show my kids that your dad was the best at something at one time in his life. And, uh, and my kids are proud of me. And, and that is a record that, that will stand forever. Uh, my kids will always love me. 
But it's a gorgeous plane. It's no wonder that people love to see this. I can't wait to see you at the next show. Well, we'll be there. All right. Thanks for showing it to us, man. Thank you, Tom. It's gorgeous. Let's say you hold three dozen aviation world records and you're still going strong. Building, rebuilding, testing, modifying, and finally attempting your latest record. Well, where do you go at the end of the day to unwind? If you're Bruce Bohannon, you just walk from the hangar to your house at your own airport, the Flying Tiger, named after the airplane that holds 30 of those records. Well, Flying Tiger Airport is one of the most wonderful things that ever happened to me. Uh, I'd been based at Cloverfield in Friendswood for many, many years, renting a tea hangar. And um, all of our test work, uh, we're, we're building motors and running them on nitrous oxide on a test cell. It was getting a little tedious at a public use airport uh, that was in a fairly large neighborhood area. So when the opportunity to, to purchase this airport came along, uh, we just it was just the, the most natural thing in the world. I'd, traded a 3,800 square foot house in a nice bedroom community in uh, south of Houston for a, a piece of pretty raw land that had a hangar on it. That was about it. Uh, it wasn't until I did it that I realized that that's the way it was meant to be. At first, Bohannon wasn't too sure if he liked the responsibility. After all, he was much more at home seated in a cockpit than in the saddle of a tractor or lawnmower. But that soon changed. It's getting harder and harder to pry me away from this place. Uh, I spend more time on my tractor out improving things and mowing grass and, uh, you know, flying airplanes still mean a lot to me, but, but taking care of the airport is, is, is a true sense of pride to me. And if there's nothing finer than having somebody land here and, and tell me what a great place this is. It's not like I don't know it already, but, you know, to hear it from somebody else, it just, you know, uh, it, it's a fantastic feeling. With pilot wife Dona, Bruce set about changing the landscape of the airport to fit their needs. And it took years, literally, to get it to looking like a decent place. There were helicopter bodies and parts all around the back of the hangar. The hangar itself was full of some junk, some good stuff, a lot of stuff we sold and cleaned out and um, just started working every, every weekend that we could to, to clean the place up and once we got it somewhat cleaned up where it was livable, then we decided we'd move mobile home on and, and just so we could get right here and start living because we just wanted to get out of town, we wanted to be on our property, our own place, and so that's what we did. It's relatively quiet, except for the welcome noise of aircraft engines. The seclusion and wide open spaces allow Bruce to indulge in another of his passions, golf. The golf is where we do kind of bludgeon nature a little bit. Uh, uh, when we were building up the land, to, to, we're going to build a house next to the woods. We needed to, a lot of dirt in order to, to raise that area. Uh, we decided to build a pond. And as we were digging it, the, the operator of the machine that was, was digging the dirt up, he told me, he says, you're not going to need as much dirt as you think you did. He says, you want me to leave you an island out there? And, wow, you know, yeah, we could hit golf balls at that. And, you know, the hardest shot in golf is an island green. You, you know, you, you watch them the most... Uh, grizzled veteran golfer just gets weak in the knees when they see an island green because they know the odds. So to me, it's, it just makes sense. If you want to get good at golf, you build the hardest shot in golf and practice on that all the time. 
Now, you know, the result of that wasn't that my iron game got razor sharp. It just got to where I don't care if I hit a ball in the water.